Whitney North Seymour is the president-elect of the American Bar Association. He takes office as president in August of 1960. That will be another step in the 35 years he has devoted to the law and its problems. Mr. Seymour has served as a law teacher and as an assistant solicitor general of the United States. That was in the Hoover administration. He's been a senior partner in one of New York's leading law firms and specialized in antitrust cases for something like the last 20 years. Whitney North Seymour was born in Chicago 58 years ago, graduated from the University of Wisconsin, received his law degree at Columbia, and served in such diverse groups as the Society of American Magicians, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and New York's Municipal Arts Society. All this from a man who lists among his early jobs carrying a spear for Sarah Bernhardt and service as a ranger at Yellowstone Park where he insists he was a grizzly bear guard at Old Faithful. For the past 35 years, Mr. and Mrs. Seymour have lived in that dark-colored house in Greenwich Village here in New York. According to their best estimates, the house is over 150 years old. Good evening, Mr. Seymour. Good evening, Ed. You know, sir, I can't help wondering whether your early experience as a spear carrier and a grizzly bear guard has been a, of any real help to you in the legal profession. Well, fortunately, most of my professional brethren don't use spears, and very few of them behave like, behave like bears. <laughs> Sounds to me like an evasive answer, Counselor. It is. <laughs> well, in checking the long list of legal groups you've served on or headed in the past, I was struck by the absence of any reference to an elected public office. Is that correct? Well, I only ran for one. When I was at Wisconsin, I ran for president of the senior class. And my opponent was a very attractive young man whose name was Frederick Bickle. Yes? He's since become a very famous actor under the name of Frederick March. Oh, yes. And when we campaigned for the sorority vote, I campaigned on careers for women, and he campaigned on things that women seem to be much more interested in, and he naturally won. <laughs> Tell me, did Mrs. Seymour participate in that election? No, she came to Wisconsin for summer school after the election from Huntington, West Virginia. Darling? Yeah. You through primping? Yes, <laughs> dear. Good evening, Mrs. Seymour. Good evening, Mr. Moore. Uh, I know your husband is constantly traveling on his law firm's business and the Bar Association business. Do uh, you generally go with him? Oh, always. I've become the greatest buff of the American Bar Association. <laughs> She's got more friends of men over 70 than any other woman <laughs> I know. Well, unfortunately, a lot of them are dying off. I think you went to England with Mr. Seymour, didn't you? Yes, I did. We had a wonderful trip. It was an experience that we'll never forget as long as we live. And as you know, Ed, the English lawyers have been invited to come over here in 1960. Yes, I do. Uh, Mr. Seymour, your father was a lawyer. Was that your boyhood ambition? Well, I started in as an archaeologist when I was a boy. I collected Indian arrowheads that was in Wisconsin, and I wrote a very learned article when I was 15, which was entitled, The Scientific and Correct Method of Opening Indian Mounds which had a very small circulation. <laughs> uh, and then did you give up collecting arrowheads? He I did. gave up collecting arrowheads, but it didn't stop collecting. We've been through old guns, shaving mugs, mechanical banks. The house just burst at the seams. I had to stop it. <laughs> There's still some of the banks around, and here are a couple that I thought you might like to see work. This is the Kicking Mule Bank. And this is the Tammany Bank, which has a little action when money is put in it. We hope. <laughs> Did it? Uh, tell yeah. me, is, is, is that the sort of thing that qualified you for the Society of Magicians? Well, I was qualified by being a very poor amateur magician as a boy. I never saw the woman in half. But my youngest son became a very good amateur magician. Uh, uh, Mr. Excuse me. Excuse me. I was just going to ask Mrs. Seymour, uh, where are the boys now? Well, one of them, the elder one, Whitney Jr., commonly known as Mike, is practicing law in New York. The younger one, Thaddeus, is uh, dean-elect of Dartmouth College and lives in Hanover with his four children. I might add that we have two grandchildren in New York, too. Uh-huh. Uh, Mr. Seymour, uh, most of your non-legal interests seem to have been uh, sort of indoor activities, reading, I can see, and collecting things. Are you interested in any outdoor sports at all? 
Well, I've never done anything in athletics. I'm a very, very poor golfer, and my outside sports are chiefly walking and conversation. Well, just how extensive is your conversational exercise? I just thought of something. Could you go downstairs with us, Mr. Murrah? I'd like to find something to show you. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, when you uh, talk with somebody like Judge Learned Hand, the conversational exercise is like climbing a high mountain peak. It is indeed. And is your walking generally aimless, or do you always... Uh... Well... We walk around New York. We try to see the beautiful old things in New York. Lately, as you probably know, the Municipal Art Society... Pardon me, darling. You go on in. I want to go look for this. I'll be in a minute. The Municipal Art Society has been organizing walks around New York to see some of the fine old things. Things like City Hall, one of the most beautiful buildings in America. Grace Church and St. Paul's, two of the landmarks of New York. And on one of our walks, we looked at that Seward statue in Madison Square, where the head is the head of Seward and the body was a spare body of Lincoln. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting that a Midwesterner... Now, this uh, picture is a picture of a great, great, great uncle of mine named Thaddeus Seymour, for whom our youngest son is named. He came to New York City in 1801 from upstate New York, where he had moved from New Canaan, Connecticut, he was born in 1776, and uh, he was on the reception committee for Lafayette when he was received in City Hall in 1825. Well, then it would be fair to say that the Seymour family has witnessed the growth of the nation since 1776, right? Yes, and before that. Of course, all Americans, whenever they uh, came here, are very much interested in the celebration which we're going to have a week from today of Law Day USA, which is, uh, uh, which was celebrated for the first time last year. Well, Mr. Seymour, the fact that Law Day falls also on May 1st, the same day the communist countries celebrate May Day, that isn't by accident, is it? No, of course not. It seemed to those who established Law Day that the contrast between the May Day celebrated by the communists and a celebration of a rule of law would make a point for our people and for the world. And so Law Day USA was devised and proclaimed by the president. It emphasizes some things about our system and the contrast to the communist system. First, that ours is a government of laws and not of men, which means there's no room for the exercise of arbitrary power under our system. Then it's our belief in the doctrine of equal justice under law the motto which is on the Supreme Court building in Washington, meaning, of course, that the poor and the rich get equal justice in our courts, a thing which the lawyers are trying to see to by their encouragement of legal aid. And all these things relate also to the Bill of Rights and the great freedoms which it guarantees, freedom of speech and press and of religion, and their correlative rights, the right to hear and the right to read. And when we think of what's happened in Hungary and what's just happened in Tibet, the contrast between the communist May Day and our Law Day becomes entirely clear. Well, Mr. Seymour, just how does the American Bar Association remind the nation of this each year? Well, last year there were 20,000 celebrations over the country. This year we hope there'll be many more. They're conducted in courthouses and in schools and in public buildings. We hope all citizens will participate in some of those ceremonies. They help to remind people not only of what I've said, but also of the fact that the citizens have duties as well as rights, and that they owe an obligation to defend our country and our institutions and to participate in the community effort, jury service and everything of that sort. Well, sir, with your interest in explaining the importance of the law to the nation, I wonder what your feelings are on the suggestion that this might be done through yet another means, by permitting television cameras in courtrooms during trials. Well, as you know, there's a little difference of opinion between the lawyers and the broadcasters on this subject. I do. Canon 35 of the Canons of Judicial Ethics forbids the use of television, broadcasting, and photography in courtrooms. 
and uh, we are now engaged through a committee of the American Bar Association, I hope in cooperation with the media, in exploring what the real facts are as to the effect of the use of such media on trials. All of us are interested in preserving fair trials. I wonder if Mrs. Seymour has found what she went looking for. It took some doing, but I found it. What is it? It is a cup he won for pitching horseshoes in Bermuda <laughs> when he defeated the island champion who was also a policeman. And he claims he's never gone in for organized sports. But right? that is, is that his sole athletic trophy? That is his sole <laughs> athletic uh, trophy. I'm very proud of it. He tucks it away. Well, I think I must add that uh, it wasn't real athletic prowess even then. Our boys, who were then 11 and 6, heckled my opponent so severely <laughs> that he, his nerves became frayed and he lost the contest. Hardly judicial procedure, was it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> Mr. Seymour, in your long and varied experience with the law, was there any one case, any one task that gave you special satisfaction? Well, I think the most exciting thing I ever did was to spend two years in the Solicitor General's office arguing cases in the Supreme Court for the government in 1931 and nine, to 1933. And in those years, we got to know Holmes and Brandeis and Cardozo and Stone and Hughes and Roberts, among other judges, and they were among the greatest judges who ever sat on the court. And in those days in Washington, life was rather informal. And on Monday afternoons, most of the justices would entertain at tea, and it was very simple to get to know them very well. And when we went to see him, we uh, spared him a discussion of judicial philosophy, which I'm afraid a lot of people wanted to talk to him about, and we just gossiped with him. And we found that fun, and we rather thought they did. Well, those must have been very enjoyable years for you, too, Mr. Seymour, oh, weren't they? Oh, they were wonderful. But my greatest thrill came when I had tea for the first time with Mr. Justice Holmes. Mrs. Holmes had died, so that there was no regular tea day for yes. them. And the men were all going all the time, but no women. One day I said to Justice Stone that I really regretted it. I had talked to Mr. Justice Holmes a great many times, but always uh, outside the court. The next day, his secretary called and invited me to tea. And it was terrific. He was all dressed up, and this continued. I went until we left Washington twice a year, and each time, even after he retired, he'd be in full cutaway, very dapper, but with a bright red tie. And it's a sight that, until you've seen it, you just can't believe. What a wonderful experience. Oh, it was. Mr. Seymour, in reference to today's Supreme Court, many people seem to feel that the American Bar Association, uh, in some measure, has attacked the Supreme Court recently. Well, I think that's a misinterpretation of the action. The parliamentary situation was complicated, and I don't blame anybody for misunderstanding it. But the American Bar Association did not attack the Supreme Court. It made it clear that, on the contrary, it uh, had a very high regard for the position of the court as a defender of the Bill of Rights, and that it recognized the obligation of the bar to support and defend the independence of the judiciary. So I think that's a misinterpretation of the American Bar Association action. Thank you very much, Mr. Seymour. Thank you, Mrs. Seymour, for letting us come tonight. Thank you. Good night. Pleasure, Thank Paul. you very much. Good night, Ed.